As we uh, get started on our journey today, I thought it would be great if we could start by just, so first of all, can everyone hear me? Yes. I'm clear? Okay. I thought it would be great if we would just start by closing our eyes as we get in to just start this journey together that we'll be on over the next hour. And so I want to invite you to do that so that we can really ground into this conversation today, particularly since we've just had lunch. And so I'll go ahead and close my eyes too. And, um, and again, I invite you to do this with me. And so we're talking about today what it means to win the war in cyber, particularly in relation to thinking about what it means to win those everyday battles. And I would just like to know what comes to you right now in thinking about winning the war in cyber. We use that kind of war in cyber, war on cyber, pretty colloquially. What comes up for you in this moment? What images come to mind? What words come to mind? And what also comes up when you think about effective leadership? When is the time where you've witnessed great leadership or you yourself have stepped into effective leadership? And so now you can open your eyes. So I would love to know what came to you in thinking about the term war in cyber. So anyone can just raise their hand, shout something out. Universities teaching cybersecurity. Okay, universities teaching cybersecurity. Yes, thank you. Futility. Futility. Okay. Unnecessary internet connection from machinery devices. Okay, unnecessary. Um, um, uh, say IOTs. Yeah, yeah, unnecessary IOTs. Unnecessary IOTs. Yeah. Okay. And medical systems. Medical systems. Okay, thank you. Governmental resilience. Governmental resilience, yes, absolutely. And so, and so hearing all of these things, then what are we looking to protect? What are we, what are we looking to protect if we're thinking about this, this term or what comes up for us more on cyber? More in cyber. Electricity and Wi-Fi. That's right, electricity and Wi-Fi. Hospitals and healthcare. Hospitals and healthcare. Our way of life. Our way of life. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so we're looking to protect all of that, right? We're looking to protect our businesses. We're looking to protect our community, the public. We're looking to support, um, well, the military supports themselves, but obviously when we think about the war in cyber, it's hard to not think about it in terms of government or in military terms. But of course, we do have a way of life that we do want to protect. We have people in our life that we want to protect. We want to protect their data. Uh, we want to be able to support people in living full, conscious lives where they can achieve their purpose, and live in a way that supports their own happiness. And all, all of us in this room play an important role in that and helping people to do that. And we do that in our own ways. We contribute in different ways in our companies and in communities around the world. And... I, uh, growing up, I was someone who was fascinated with the Kennedys. And there was one story about John F. Kennedy that I absolutely loved. And he was visiting the Space Center one day. And he walked up and he went to a senior leader and he said, so tell me, what is it that you do here? And the senior leader said, we're going to the moon. And then JFK walked up to an engineer. And when he walked up to the engineer, he said, so, he shook his hand, so tell me, what is it that you do here? And the engineer looked at him and he said, we're going to the moon. So then JFK walked up to a janitor. He walked up to the janitor and said, so tell me, what is it that you do here? And the janitor said, we're going to the moon. Everyone from the top level leader in the organization all the way to the janitor, every single person knew what the mission was. And until this day, there has never been a space program like the Apollo program in the 1960s and 70s anywhere in the world. 
This image is of JFK receiving a briefing at Cape Canaveral. And for maybe any Americans in the room, you might notice Vice President and LBJ, Lyndon Baines Johnson. You see Bob uh, McNamara sitting there as well, head of the Department of Defense, Secretary of Defense. So there, when we think about what it means to win the war on cyber, to achieve something, or to just even think about, because we're not really talking about, right? These are colloquial terms, and, and even for the purpose of this conversation, we're not really talking about winning and losing, and even the term battles. Uh, those, are, uh, those are words to help ground us in this conversation today, but really we're talking about an ongoing way of life. But what does that mean? What does that mean to even sustain it the way that we do have to sustain it, which is also different than thinking about the Apollo program. But you know, this is what we're doing. And you know, I can't help but think, and when we all go back to our workplace, you know, how are the teams there, the security teams, do they all know what the mission is? Are they, do they all know what the mission is? And what about the larger team in our businesses? Do they know what the mission is when it comes to cyber? What if we expand that? And we just say, what about in our industries? Do our peers in our industries, particularly the most regulated ones, if we were to just use that as an example, not that that's more important, but just use that as an, an example. So we look at banking, healthcare, insurance. If we expand that to our peer practitioners, do all, are we all aligned on what the mission is and what we're looking to do when it comes to cybersecurity? Now let's expand that. Let's say we're, we're in Dublin, we're in the Global North. What if we expand that to everyone in the Global North, all of our other practitioners in the Global North and leaders in cybersecurity? Do we all know what the mission is and what we're looking to do? And so what if we expand it to all the cybersecurity leaders across the world? Do we, do we know what we're, do we know what the mission is of what we're trying to achieve? So this is a way, it's not just a way of thinking, it's a way of being. It is a way of operating in the world, it is a way of operating in our work. And it's part of how we have the ability to evolve this industry to go to the next level. And so we'll talk about that today. We'll talk about what that path of alignment is, and particularly when it comes to thinking about this in terms of our everyday battles. We'll also talk about what it means to expand our own capacity as leaders, and particularly as practitioners as well. And we'll also talk about how we can move the industry forward, how we can focus on delivering excellence and seeing ourselves as part of this larger whole. So I was in New York last month, and I was walking in Central Park. So I'm sure many people have been to have many people been to Central Park in New York. Okay, so I was near 59th Street in Central Park, and it was a cold January day, but I just felt like being out in nature. And I was going for a walk, and I found my found myself just walking uh, like 20 plus blocks, and I found myself at the Natural History History Museum. And um, inside the Natural History Museum is Hayden Planetarium. And I just, was, it was like I was being pulled there. And so I purchased a ticket, I went in, and it had been, I can't remember the last time I went to a planetarium, so it was a little exciting for me. And when I went in, I was like the only like adult that was there alone. <laughs> Parents were there <laughs> with their small children. Um, and I just kind of looked around for a moment. It was like, oh, this is really interesting. <laughs> um, but I have to tell you, like when the lights went down and the film started, to just hear the oohs and ahs of the children completely <laughs> set me back to when I was a kid because I absolutely love so studying the solar system and the universe. And so it was, it was so much fun and I could feel their excitement. And, and I was just, and I was reminded of just, oh my gosh, the vastness of the solar system and the universe. And the <laughs> reminder that Earth is 4.56 billion years old. Oh my gosh. And, <laughs> You know, the, we think about life, the fact that complex life can be sustainable on this planet 
is just, I mean, it's, it's just incredible when you think about it. And you think about other planets that at some point was able to sustain life because they had water, Venus, Venus, Mars, but for whatever reasons, water doesn't exist the way that it used to. So they, they, at some point, they maybe were able to hold life, but they aren't able to hold complex life like us. And it's really incredible to think that Earth is, is able to do this, you know, simply because of the magnetic field, simply because of our proximity to the moon, our atmosphere, all of these things that somehow didn't necessarily go right when it came to other planets like Venus and Mars. But it, but it went right here. And when you think about our own evolution, 3.5 billion years ago, and to who we are now as Homo sapiens, again, it's just like, just incredible to think about. Really amazing to think about. But man, great things take time. Great things take time. And so we think about our own cyber evolution, what's taking place here. If we go back to the 1880s, and this is a whole presentation on itself, so we're just going to have one little slide here. <laughs> but, you know, we think about that. And we think about where we are now in the present. And it's, it's kind of amazing. And it's kind of, you know, it's kind of unfolded, you know, patches here, patches there, really, you know, going to the needs of, of what's happened, you know, responding in some ways to threats and, and risks. But how do we see it evolving in the future? Because we have the opportunity to really set that, to really drive it, not be as responsive, perhaps. And so I'm thinking about, like, where are we not only in 2030 or 2050 or 2100, but where can we be in 2250? And part of that, we just have no idea, right? There's just so many unknowns there. But we, there's, a, there's an opportunity here to evolve how we've been working, what we've been doing, and how we can truly truly think about what it means to raise the baseline in this, in this world when it comes to safety and security and privacy, as we heard from early, uh, heard earlier today. So how do we evolve our own consciousness as an industry as we approach and think about security and cybersecurity? How do we change and evolve our consciousness and so when we think about our own cyber revolution, right, we can think about how, how is our evolution going, you know, and where do we want it to be? Where do we want it to go? How do we think it's going? And I feel like everyone in this room has an answer to that. I feel like everyone in this room has an opinion on that. I would actually love to hear it. So let's definitely talk about it. <laughs> so this is me. And uh, that little head down there in the corner, in the right corner, is my brother. So just the fact that he was born in, in this picture lets me know that I was probably about six years old in this picture. And I was one of those children that really knew. Um, people ask me all the time, I, how, did you, how did you get into security? How did you get into doing the work that you're doing? And I, for me, I always knew as a young child that this was the work that I wanted to do in the world. Like, I knew security was for me. It was, uh, it was, it was a calling. It felt like a purpose. Um, and it felt like I, that it was, it was felt so innate to me that I felt like I had done something related to this in previous lives. Like, it is just part of who ingrained in me and who I am. And it's probably why it's also not surprising that I have a twin sister that does the work that she does. And so when I was young, um, I was like, you know, how, what do I, what can I do? How can I really think about the work that I want to do in the world and how can I really get started in that? And so I don't know if any of you remember this and I, so I don't know if this would be familiar with people across the world, but this is, uh, something that we would wear in the United States if you're part of the safety patrol. So I had the opportunity in the fifth grade. I was 10 years old at Woodview Elementary School in Bolingbrook, Illinois. And I was that person that was like, I'm getting started with my purpose. I know this is what I want to do. So I'm just going to put this, I'm putting this sash on now as part of the safety patrol. And so I was that person that was like, okay, no, you cannot, you cannot cross the street now. <laughs> And then I was that person that was like, okay, yes, you could cross, you could cross. And I was like, oh, and this feels really good. Like, I'm living my purpose. This is what I want to be doing. Really focusing on how I can protect people. 
And then I was in the eighth grade, and I read all of the Nancy Drew books in the school library my eighth grade year. So it was like 50-something books. And I loved Nancy Drew. I loved the way she was solving problems for people. I loved that she was helping people. I loved the fact that she cared. And I was like, you know what? When I grow up, I'm going to be part of the safety patrol. I'm going to be Nancy Drew. And then I saw Matthew Broderick in War Games, and I was like, oh, my goodness. And how many people are with me when they saw, when I, with Matthew Broderick in War Games? I was like, oh, my goodness. I was like, I want to be Matthew Broderick in War Games. I said, okay, I've got it. I've got my future. So I want to. I'm going to be part of the safety patrol. I am going to be Nancy Drew. And literally, when my aunt asked me what I wanted to do, I told her Nancy Drew. <laughs> And then I said, I'm going to be Matthew Broderick at War Games. Like, this is it. This is, this is my future. And my mom was really great. She was super supportive. Just an inc incredibly wonderful woman. And so she put me in some engineering courses at the time, which was really great. And she, I had the opportunity to go to engineering camp at Purdue University. And part of this was also because she really wanted me to be around people that looked like me. She wanted me to see other people of color that were doing this because she wanted me to know that it was possible. She wanted me to be to see people who looked like me doing this work. And that was part of my own evolution. So we talk about this evolution of what's going on in the industry, but we also talk about these evolutions. These evolutions also come down to all of us as individuals. And what, what is our own evolution? And so I went to university. Back in 1998, I was a freshman, so that's 2023 now, so that was 25 years ago. I was a freshman on campus, and I was a double major in computer science and law and security. And I walked into my first computer science class because, of course, I mean, <laughs> I'm going to be part of Safety Patrol, right? I'm going to be Nancy Drew, and I'm going to be Matthew Broderick in War Games. Right? I've, I've got a doubt. And when I walked into my first computer science class, I didn't see anyone that looked like me. I don't recall seeing any women, and the few people of color I did see were Asian men. And I could just feel myself start to just kind of shrink a little bit. And I started to continue to go to class, but I started to struggle. And then I started to go to tutoring. And when I was uh, at tutoring one day, we'll call him Tim, Tim said to me, look, this is all pretty basic. So if you don't understand this, then maybe this isn't for you. And in that moment, like I could feel my dreams just like start to ooze out away. And I just was just sat there and was like, I, I think he's right. I, I don't think I can do this. Th this isn't for me. And the way that I remembered it was that I dropped the class, and then I dropped the major. But I actually went back and looked at my transcript a few years ago, and it was probably too late to drop the course. So I actually had a grade there for the course, which was a B. And in the United States, the grading scale was A, B, C, D, and F. So I had a B, but I still dropped the major because I didn't think I could do it. So as I reflected on that, I was like, that is huge imposter syndrome, like huge. <laughs> and I just was like, I don't know what I'm going to do now. Like I had this whole vision for my life and I felt like a failure. And I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And so I ended up just having to just be in this space of just allowing myself to continue to be pulled forward. I just had to know that there, that there was something at the horizon, that there was something that I was being pulled to, even though I couldn't now see it. I couldn't name it. I could feel it, but I didn't know what it was. And I felt like that was all I could do. And for a while, it felt kind of aimless. It felt kind of like, like there wasn't a grounding. But all I could do was look to the horizon and keep moving forward. And so now we are here 25 years later, and um, I, have a, I have a company and a job where I actually do get to be part of the safety patrol and Matthew Broderick and Nancy Drew every day, which is pretty awesome. <laughs> you know, but, you know, so 25 years later, right? So, again, great things take time. Great things take time. And I know every single one of you understands this because every single one of you 
have your own story. Every single one of you are going through something right now, or you've gone through something in your work that has changed who you are as a leader, and that has changed who you are as a practitioner. And you don't see things the same way. And I've heard some of your stories earlier today when I attended some talks. And so fast forward also from that moment to from 1998 to 2015. Um, and this was a few years after I had the business. And I, in the United States, uh, the CISO service wasn't something that was uh, that people were aware of at the time. It was really something that me and the company were really innovating. We're in New York City, and if there was any place that people would be interested in the CISO service, you'd think it would be there. Uh, but it was actually pretty challenging, you know, and we, because when we talked to people about it, people that were not in the industry, people had no idea what a CISO was. So we really had to spend time educating people, explaining to people what that, who, what, who's in that role, why that role was necessary, um, as well as just other areas of, of security and cybersecurity. And then talking to practitioners as well, there was this need to just continue to validate why the CISO role versus an MSP or, or um, that that could that could add value in a different way. And it was in 2017 where I was talking to a woman who said, "I want to introduce you to my general counsel." So I walked into the general counsel's office, and. We started talking, and what was very clear is that she was visibly pregnant, visibly pregnant. And so uh, uh, we were talking, and she just asked me, you know, could you come in and could you help us meet the deadline that we have? Uh, they had a deadline that basically within 45 days um, they had to meet. Is everyone Is everyone familiar or has heard of the Department of Financial Services regulation in the state of New York? It's a cybersecurity regulation. Okay, so I hear some yeses. So it's um, so that regulation is one of the strongest cybersecurity regulations in the world. Now it is strictly, for the most part, for, was strictly for financial services industry. So banking and insurance and, and mortgages, other areas, the uh, mortgage brokers, um, and so that had gone into effect. So I'd imagine in Europe, people were really focused on GDPR. So at that time in New York, if you were in the, in those industries, you were focused on this particular regulation. So it was, it was a very big deal at the time, just like GDPR was a very big deal here. And when that happened, um, I just said, yeah, you know, I, I can do this. I know I can come in and I can support you. And she said, good. And literally 14 days after I started, she was gone on maternity leave. She was gone for four months. Um, and at that point, I was, um, um, and, and I was reporting to the general counsel as a CISO, which was actually really interesting. So if anyone wants to talk about that, um, we can talk about that later. Um, but for me, it was important that A, that she had what she needed as a leader, um, and that she felt comfortable and confident that she could go on maternity and leave and, and take care of her family. Uh, and so, um, and so I started working with them to meet this particular deadline. And so I was working with the global CISO. Um, I was working with other security leaders in the organization. There was a lot to do, a lot that we had to focus on. And we had a lot of, uh, we had a lot of very focused discussions and some of them that were, that were challenging. And I remember, um, one of the, one time I went out to lunch with the global CISO. And he, he told me that uh, one of the security leaders, one of my peers, who was a senior leader in the organization, and though the business was my business and SVC, so I had the authority to make specific decisions, he was disappointed and was not happy with me that I didn't take his guidance on something in particular in relation to the work that we were doing to meet this deadline in 45 days. And I remember saying to him, you know, and I had to explain to the global CISO, who was you know, my boss, um, I had to explain to him my thought process on it. Because though I appreciated what my peer and my partner was doing from, a, from, a, from his perspective and his standpoint, this was my business. And I had the authority to make decision. And in the end, I was right. Now, what we all know, though, just because you're right doesn't actually mean you're right, right? <laughs> just because you're right doesn't mean you're right. But though I, in this case, I was right, that still didn't mean that I didn't need him. And that he, he needed to know that he was valued. He needed to know that I needed him as a partner. And that if he had something he wanted to say to me, that I would absolutely listen to him. And part of the challenge that, part of the reason this was so challenging is because it was high, it was high visibility with the CEO. So, and this, this particular, uh, this particular, um, this, what we were focused on, this 45 day deadline was high visibility. 
So the CEO was involved. The CEO was part of the decision making of what was going on. And so he wasn't happy with the fact that I, in this high visibility environment, that I didn't necessarily take his guidance. And so, and I completely understood that. I completely understood that. And so, um, uh, that was probably the, also the, the, probably the most stern that my global CISO had ever been with me during that time and in that conversation. And we didn't speak for uh, probably about a month after that, but that was only because of the cycle of our calls. Um, and we had been speaking quite frequently with everything going on. But when we spoke again, we were in tandem. It was like, it was like our relationship had deepened and there was trust that was there that was at the foundation of our relationship. And there is something special when you have these tough conversations early on in a relationship with work, when you're dealing with these really challenging things, that allows you to build very, very strong relationships. And part of these, part of these challenges is part of these everyday battles, right? These, these are, that's an example of an everyday battle. These are things that we all face, right? These tough conversations that make a difference and make an impact into the business outcomes that are taking place within our organization, the outcomes that are in the, our programs across the world. And it's important to also recognize when we talk about these everyday battles, they're not just battles that we have with others, they're battles that we have within ourselves, okay? So again, it's important that we take care of ourselves in this process as well. And so in this case, all that mattered for me when it came to my, my colleague was that we were all moving forward together in this process and that we were working together on how to move the needle forward for our program. And so for me, what that meant was I just need to keep looking past the horizon. I just needed to keep looking forward. I didn't really know exactly where we were going or what this would fully look like. I knew we had a deadline in 45 days that we had to meet, but where we would be in six months, a year, I wasn't sure. All I knew was that I was a very small piece in this large puzzle. And I knew that though my voice mattered, that didn't mean it, ma that didn't mean it mattered more than anybody else's. But I was going to speak it. And I was going to say what I felt needed to be said. And it's probably one of the most important things that has allowed me to be successful, particularly in my role as CISO. So what mattered most for me, when we think about, and I would say for all of these everyday battles that we're talking about, and I know that so many of you are going through your own, and again, I heard some examples of this earlier today, whether we're talking about bug bounty programs or whether we're talking about threat modeling, is that we were working together to solve these biggest, these big challenges, and particularly our own biggest challenges. That with even this short time frame that we were focused on our own security, um, we were focused on our security commitments not being a checklist, right? That we were actually building a sustainable program. And that our program was dynamic and that it was able to change and that we were able to respond to threats that came up or risks, need and business needs. And it wasn't a static program. And that we were focused on creating a culture of positive habits within the security team and technology teams, but also the broader company, that we were really doing something that was sustainable, right? And if someone were to come in and look at that, that that's what they could see, even though we were really focused on these 45 days. And so when we think about these everyday battles, right, winning the war in <laughs> cyber uh, means winning the everyday battles. Here, like, these are just some examples of where we can find these battles. But this is uh, very small. Right? What would be a battle that you're facing right now or that you maybe have faced in the past or know someone is facing that isn't listed here? Getting developers to fix bugs. Getting developers to fix bugs. Exactly. Yes. What's another one? Getting developers to do threat modeling. Getting, getting developers to do threat modeling. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Like the, these are the everyday battles. These are the everyday battles. Absolutely. Budget from the board for the security. Yes, budget from the board for the security. Absolutely. That is a big one. Like these are all big ones, but yeah, that matters. And you know why? That matters because we really don't, we, we can influence that, but we have maybe less control over that. We have less control, but it is so hard. And so important, particularly when we're supporting the business objectives of the organization, right? The great things take time. Great things take time. So, and so we'll fast forward now. 
six, so past those 45 days, so that's about uh, yeah, two and a half months in. We'll go forward six months. So it was only six months, but a lot had changed now at this point in the organization. We, we now had a program that we were really working, building. It was growing strong. So we were dealing with many of the same challenges that you're doing, dealing with, the challenges of any growing cybersecurity program. So, and then we learned that there was going to be a merger. And so when we looked at, when we looking at all the companies that were co the coming together in order for this merger, it ended up being about a $20 billion merger. So it was no small thing. And there was a lot that had to be done. And then we got a note um, that the regulator was actually going to come for a visit. So the full regulation hadn't even gone into effect yet, but we already got a note that the regulator was coming. And it was just, it was kind of mind boggling. And so that we were, that we were chosen out of all the companies that you could have chosen uh, that were regulated by the state of New York it just happened to be our company that they're going to come to. And so with all this going on, you could imagine that that for the business leaders in the organization, the thought was, do, is, do we really need to focus on this right now? Do we really need to focus on, on cybersecurity? Like, we have this merger going on. Yeah, we have the visit, but we're going to go through a merger. So do they, does the regulator really care about what's going on with the program? And I was like, oh, that's a question I'm not even going to answer. <laughs> like, please, and I don't want you asking those questions. And so what we had to do is that we had to get clear. What was the mission? What were we focused on? What are we trying to do? What do we want to accomplish? What have we been accomplished, trying to accomplish? Does anything really change? Has anything really changed? I mean, the fact that we still need to secure this, this program, or this, this company. In fact, if you're going through a merger, you need to ensure it's, you know, even, that's just more incentive for it to be secure. We had to focus and really assess how is the evolution of our program going? Is it going the way that we want? What are the gaps? And how do we fill those gaps? <clears throat> and then we had to just get it done. We had to execute. Everyone played a role. Every single person in the organization played a role. And we had to be clear on who literally, though, could do what. Like, what really could the business partners do? What re they, could, they could play a role in this, but what really could they do? And really help them, help them be great at that. What could our other stakeholders do? We helped them to be great at that. And so there was a lot going on, but we just had to stay focused on the horizon. Like, where are we going? What are we trying to do? We're focusing on our own evolution right now that's going on in the organization, but we still have this evolution of the program that we have to keep moving towards. And so that's where we stayed, and that's where we kept our focus on. And in the end, we went through the visit, and... You know, there's this moment that, again, I know every single one of you have gone through, where you have gone through some major challenge within your own experience, whether work or personal, and you have found yourself looking into a mirror. And when you look at yourself in the mirror, you know you are not the same person because of that experience. This was that experience for many of those leaders that, that, were, that were here and participated in this, in this um, experience, in this initiative with this, with this organization. And so how was our evolution going, <laughs> you know, at this point? So now, by now, at this point, the regulator had come in for the visit. <clears throat> About a few months had passed, and the regulator had come in. We had spent time with the regulator. We spent time in the meetings, giving them the documents that they asked for. We completed the, uh, 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 completed, uh, the, the, the meetings and that we had to have with them. And... I kept asking the general counsel after we hadn't heard for a while. I said, so have you heard back from the regulator? What, you know, what, what's their feedback? What are they saying? She's like, no, I haven't heard back. I said, okay. So I went to the CFO. I said, hey, have you heard back from the regulator? I, you know, what, what have you heard? He said, yeah, no, they, we haven't heard anything. But what they said was is if they had anything for us, they would let us know. And I said, oh. I said, okay. They said, yeah, they don't, they don't have anything. And I said, well, can you, can you ask? And you ask about it next time you meet with them because they were meeting on you know many other different topics, and so they said that if they had recommendations that would go back to the business, that they would tell us. But at this time, there were no recommendations back to the business. That there was nothing that they can tell us to improve our cybersecurity program. That everything that we gave them in terms of documentation, 
the answers that we provided them in the interviews fulfilled what they were looking for and what the expectations were. Not only for the regulator, but for the regulation before the, the cybersecurity program itself, which was pretty unheard of. And so even my group CISO was like, no, that doesn't happen. The regulator always has something to say. The regulator always has feedback. <laughs> and we just have to wait for them to come back and say something, because that never happens. And the regulator never did. And so when we talk about these everyday battles that we go through, that we come and we show up every day, that we are fully present, that we go in with the intention, that we are focused on what is for the highest and best good for all involved. We are patient, we are intentional, and we have the ability to achieve things that we couldn't even think of. And again, I know every single one of you have had these experiences. Part, of, part I know is because you're sitting in this room. There is something that you've had to experience just to even be here. For you to have the level of skill set that you do, for you to lead the way that you do, you've had to have gone through something similar to just even be here. So when we talk about these everyday battles, right, we talked about the fact that we have our own internal, our self. Like, how are we leading ourselves? How are we supporting our own self as we go through our own days? But we also have our internal within the organization. We talked a bit about that and all of these different battles that take place. And we also have the external ones that can take place with the regulator, the attackers that are coming in, all, all of these, you know, all, all of these, you know, various, various, uh, entities and, and, um, and, um, um, and, you know, challenges that we face. So there are multiple. And it is how we show up in the everyday that helps us to think about what a result could actually be for us in a war. Like, what, what, what could that result actually be? Now, again, when we're talking, like the terms we're using here, we're not talking, when we talk about colloquially what's used as the war in cyber or the war on cyber, clearly this is an ongoing sustainable thing. So we're, again, we're talking about what is the way of being and how we're actually showing up and doing this every day that can actually eventually produce an outcome that we can all feel really good about? Because it's going to keep going. It's not like it's going to be, it's finite, right? Like we're, we're in this every day. And, and we depend on each other, right? Because I know I have Verizon, so I'm really, I'm really, I'm really counting on the fact that I have Verizon, which in uh, many um, in the United States, many of you may have heard of it, but it's one of the uh, largest, you know, well, it's the largest telecommunications company. So I'm really, I really am holding the vision that the security teams there are, are doing their job, right? Because we're in this together. So what we talked about today was this pathway in alignment. We talked about these everyday battles that influence the outcome of a war and the possibilities of a war of any experience that we're ultimately facing, which could be, you know, our, it, and it's ongoing, right? It's there's battle after battle after battle that 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 serve these circles that we saw. They just expand. They just keep going, right? They're not finite. They continue to keep going. We talked about what this means and how we can expand our own capacity as cyber leaders and cyber practitioners, and how we can move the industry forward, how we can focus on delivering excellence, and how we can make ourselves as part of this larger whole, right? That we can even put the whole ahead of ourselves. The whole ahead of ourselves. And we do that by, by staying focused on the horizon, by staying focused on the, what's in front of us. And so I want to invite you on a journey. I want to invite you on a journey. So with me, so we, on this journey, where we're, we look at a new horizon, that there's a possibility of a new horizon for all of us as we are all going through our own battles, as we are all within, within this war on cyber and, and our workplace, we have our own wars that are going on within the workplace, right? So everyone has their own thing that they're going through. And then we have our personal battles and our personal wars that we're going through. So I want to invite you to join me on a journey of looking out to a new horizon. 
a horizon where all of us as developers, as hackers, pen testers, fill in the blank, that we just don't look at everyone in this room, but we look at all of our peers across all industries. And what would it mean if we were all to walk on this path together? That we were all committed, that we all were looking at a horizon where we could see this industry evolving in being something more, where it's living up to its full potential. What could that mean? How could that alone, all of us walking together, looking at the horizon, does it mean we're all doing the same thing? It certainly doesn't mean that we all are doing everything the same way. There is room for creativity. That's part of looking at the horizon is. It doesn't mean it has to be this way. It means that we can continue to do the things that we love. It also doesn't mean that everything is looking at technology as a solution. And I get that technology is a, is a huge, but I don't want us to be constrained to that. And though my background may be very different from yours, I do understand that. I've been on the board for the past four, uh, four years of an incredible organization, uh, an incredible startup that is still pre-revenue, but their IP alone is already worth a hundred million. And another organization that built a tech platform where their vision is to train 500,000 leaders to impact a billion. I get the importance and the impact of technology, but I'm also asking us, can we do more? Can we, can we see further? Can we think further? Can we think, um, um, think deeper? Can we feel deeper? Can we evolve our own consciousness as individuals that can then allow us to evolve the consciousness of our industry? so that we can move forward in a different way. And so I want to invite you all on a journey where you are all part of this solution, where you are all here with walking with all of us, all of our peers across the world, that we are walking to this horizon, and that this is the future evolution of our industry. And this is where we can see change and growth and where we can see the possibility of what it means to win a war in cyber. And I was talking to a practitioner the other day and she said to me, do you really think that we could win the war in cyber? You think it's possible? And I said, oh, I think that's a great question. I think I will ask the audience that question. So do you think that it's possible? Do you think that it's possible. So thank you very much. We have got some time before the break. If there are any questions, and I have got a microphone as well if you guys need. Okay, great. How does one become a CISO? Great question. Um, I think that, I think the, what I have learned is that there is no clear path to becoming a CISO. Um, I think my path was certainly a non-traditional path. Um, and I think that the biggest thing that I can say is well, two things. One, because this is a, this is actually, a, I'm giving another talk on this later, so I'm glad you asked this question. I think the key thing is one, people, I know that there are a lot of viewpoints on what a skill sets a CISO should have. I think it's very important to know that in a technical role, technical role where technical expertise is absolutely necessary for that role, that we absolutely need technical people in that role. I think when it comes to a CISO, they need to be an expert generalist. They need to be an expert in something, but they don't need to be the expert in everything, right? That's what their team is for. So do they need to understand technology? Absolutely. But do they need to understand everything about technology? Do they have to have had 20 years of technology experience? Absolutely not. In fact, I would also put in the argument that that could, in some cases, um, that would, that would limit the amount of creativity that we had, we would have if every, if all the CISOs had the same background. So, um, I think what's most important is how they're able to lead, how they're able to influence, how they're able to, um, um, set the vision for the organization as an expert generalist and how they're able to lead. 
And so I think that there is no um, clear way, but what I do think happens along the way, whether you have been a technology leader for 20 years or a security expert for 20 years and you move into a CISA role, or you come from another um, line of business and you come into a CISA role, is that there's a transformation, that a, per a personal and internal transformation that absolutely has to happen because you have to really be grounded because this is a role where you are constantly challenged. You are challenged by your own team. You are challenged by, by everyone, right? And you have to wake up every day on some level knowing that the decision you make that day possibly, you know, could be something that not only people not support, but I mean, I have I had a client tell me not too long ago, you do know that Cecil is the first person to get fired. They'll be the first person to get fired in this organization. I said, yeah, I know. I said, that's why I do this work, you know, because I, I'm willing to take that risk. And the truth is, is that's not the case anymore. That's not the case very much anymore because we do have leaders that have a strong understanding um, that um, just because something doesn't, necess doesn't necessarily go right doesn't mean that, the, that it's the CISO's fault because we need to continue to evolve and grow, and that's an area I think that's important to evolve and grow in. Um, but you do have to have a very high level of risk that you are willing to withstand. I think that that's one of those things we don't often talk about. Yeah, so great question. Oh, there's a question here? Okay, yes. Hi. So you talked about that pivotal moment in 1998 where you dropped the major, and so clearly you've overcome that now that you're here on stage. How did you overcome that barrier and the imposter syndrome that came with it? Oh, wow. I think what happened, because I really, I was really holding on to that for a really, really long time, and it was probably, I would started the business in 2012, but... And I knew that technology was the work that I wanted to do. And I was working in tech with technology, but I still wasn't, I can't say that I was fully confident in it. It wasn't until 2015 where I happened to have a client who, uh, gave, who I was doing work at the Tribeca Film Festival and I had, I had the opportunity to speak there. And then I had the opportunity to attend some of the films that were there. There was a documentary called Code Debugging the Myth. And it was all about women in tech. And it was documenting how women in tech, why there aren't women in tech, and how women who had an interest in technology when they were younger, like what happened in college. And I literally saw my story in these women. And I like, I just, it was like I was crying. I felt, I just felt like this huge wave of like relief that I wasn't a failure, that I'm not like, you know, let me to use this term, we should never call ourselves this, but I just felt like I couldn't get it. I just thought that I wasn't good enough that I couldn't get it. But I could see, I could see how this happened. And it made me change the way that I looked at myself. And that was probably that true turning point. And this was, this was in 2015. So it wasn't too long ago where I was able to really look at myself differently and go, okay, I know that I can do this. My, my path is different. The way that I have to learn and how I lead is going to be different and how I spend time learning um, is going to be very different and how I spend my nights and weekends, but it's something I'm willing to do. And so that's what I did. So, yeah, thank you for asking. <laughs> I have another question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so with um, what happened with Joe Sullivan, the ex um, CISO from Uber and like report and all of that like do you see that changing how many people want to become a CISO or like scaring people off from that role because it scares the out of me <laughs> yeah you know I think it can be scary but I think uh, I'm actually diving into that as a case study for another talk I'm giving to and I think I feel like I, I personally need to give to do more spend more time on that but what I've heard other people say is is that they're and I, again, I just want to say this generally, that there, there is a line. And you do want to be very, you want to be very careful about how, what line you cross as a CISO. And so whatever you do, like, for example, the regular, the regulatory visit, everything has to be an integrity. Like, you know, the CISO should be the model of integrity, even if it puts them, um, uh, at, a, at a challenging position. You know, you, you constantly have to model that. And that takes a level of strength that I don't, that is very, that takes a level of strength that is very hard 
Like that, that it is those types of things that I think is really important that a CISO has as a skill set for them to be a, a, a CISO. And you can't measure that. You can't always even, you can't measure that in an interview. Maybe if you're doing a situational based interview and you ask a question, can you tell me about a time when you, and they actually have an example of when they've done something, but it's really hard to measure. Um, and, um, and the thing also is that you can feel so much like your back is against the wall and you feel like even if you step over a line and you do this one thing, that it's okay. It just, but you, it's a line. You just, it's such a fine line. And, um, and so I think that as more people learn to cease a role, as more people feel more confident in their own skill sets, I think that, uh, and also, uh, as the CISO role becomes, um, uh, kind of more plentiful where it's more, it's, uh, more in different, more organizations around the, the world, I think people have an opportunity to really see if it is for them. And I think what it is is again, it's just, it's a leadership, it's a leadership growth area. And I think, I think it can and it has scared people off, but I think it doesn't have to. I think people just have to know what it means to, what it means to do this role when no one is happy with your decisions <laughs> and how you can still stay grounded. Yeah. And that goes back to those internal battles. It goes back to those internal battles. Yeah. Thanks for your talk. Um, so uh, speaking of partnering with the other executives, so a lot of us are in the application security world. How do you work with CTOs and the heads of software engineering to convince them they should prioritize the security bugs we were talking about earlier? Do you, Because you come from the financial industry background, are you mostly using regulations as kind of the driver on that? Because a lot of the issues we find aren't necessarily regulations, but they're still security vulnerabilities. Yeah, uh, great question. So I have found that when I work with technical teams, um, I, I make it very clear for myself, what it, for with them, what it is that I'm looking for. I find that just like with the, the CISO and the security team in the beginning, it's about building that relationship and making it clear what we want and how we can get there. And whatever plan we create, it's co-created together. And it's, I'm not trying to ask something of them that they really feel that they cannot do. So part of my role is to help them, is to get to a point where they actually first start to believe that they actually could do what, I, what I'm asking of them. Um, and then if they can't, still maybe challenge and push a little bit more, but it is, uh, but it is always being in partnership and moving along the way. Um, and in fact, for us, the regulatory visit that we had, obviously the today technology team was so involved. Uh, that there, you know, there are times where I needed information from them and I had no problem like going in and just listening to them, ask her, answer my question. And I was writing everything down. Like I had no problem doing whatever was easiest for them to be able to help support what we all needed. Right. Again, it's the whole ahead of the self because if they aren't successful, I'm not successful. <laughs> okay. And so my goal is always about how can I help you be successful? but we still do have to do this. So how can we do it together? And I have no problem humbling myself in that way. Um, and this also goes back to how do we change our consciousness as an industry? Because the truth is, is that um, we can't, you know, we, can't um, we can't push people so far and ask them to do things that um, they, they may not really believe that they can do um, or really ask them to do things where they just maybe not, do not literally have the time to do. So we need to better, we need a better problem solve that. So I was just going to add to the, uh, to the previous question. It's from more from an, my perspective has been on driving the AppSet program in my uh, company. Yeah, NYDFS is a great aid. Like here's the big stick, but the other side of how do you get engineering managers to do this? Well, this is just good engineering. Yeah, absolutely. That's uh, like all of our policies and everything else is just based around this is just good engineering. Why would you not want to do good engineering? Absolutely. And, you know, and I'm glad that you brought that up because the, the thing is, is that, you know, what I find when I work with technical leaders, they want to do the right thing. They, you know, it's not like they wake up that morning going, I'm just refused to do this. You know, and even though there was this uh, kind of this big stick there when it came to the regulation, that was really more of motivation. Them actually doing the work was really about how the approach of how it happened of them of uh, and, uh, and also the reward that they would feel in being a part of this process and that this was a win that we were all doing together. 
but yeah, I would agree, I agree with you 100%, 100%. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for, yeah, for sharing your, your experience uh, <laughs> and many things like this. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, when you have a team uh, as a CISO, uh, it's a, it's, I don't know if really, really good uh, sometimes, but uh, when you have some fights, but it's, you have some fights. Yeah. But when you are alone, <laughs> this is another thing, mm-hmm. uh, because especially because yeah, you have to build everything by yourself mm-hmm. and discuss by yourself, and nobody else sometimes uh, care about it. Mm-hmm. And uh, what do you think, in your experience, uh, it's a good way to manage this? Mm. Manage the loneliness. The loneliness. Oh yeah. goodness! Yes, thank you for bringing that one up. So. You, I think having peers is really important. Um, uh, peer CISOs, um, and, uh, and also, um, I would also say having good outlets for how we support our own, uh, resiliency. By that, I mean exercising, uh, meditation every morning at 7.45 a.m. Eastern time. I lead a meditation for leaders. Because I, this, because this is that important. What you just said, it is that important that people have a way of releasing before they go into the workday so that they can actually give their best. And I think that having a routine around this is really important. And I think that, uh, I think how we take care of ourselves helps us in the workplace so that we can manage through that. And I think the other thing I would say is what are, having those three or four things that we will always be, for lack of a better term, bulletproof in. That no matter what, this is what we will always stand for. And that that is also our guiding post. So if it's that we will always stand for um, and doing the highest and best good for all involved. Okay, so then every decision that we make will come through that filter. If If we're standing for risks, then we will make sure that anything that's coming through that filter, that we will make sure that we are great around but that may mean something else has to give. But it's, um, but I would say how we manage the loneliness um, is by doing those things. Uh, I would, uh, but taking care of ourselves, and that happens in in multiple ways. I um, uh, I tell leaders uh, and peers and partners that I work with, you know, to make sure they're spending time with their spouse, to make sure that they're spending time with their children, to make sure that they're taking care of themselves. Um, um, and, uh, and these things may seem like they, in some cases, don't matter, but it absolutely, I think, matters because that's, I mean, I could definitely say that that's how, what helps supports me, um, 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 is doing things that I love, uh, make sure that I feel fit and that I'm taking care of myself because, and also that I'm taking care of my mind and my own energy because however I show up that day, that's going to be what I give to others. And so managing that as hard as it is, it is developing those routines that allows us to do that. And so meditating every day is one of those things that for me is a must. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah thank you. Thank, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Jessica. We really appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. There is coffee and tea, uh, and I'm sure Jessica will be in the vendor area. You can ask her more questions there. <laughs>